Okay, let's go ahead and start working on pop art and how it challenges tradition. So if you remember from our discussion of abstract expressionists, we already have artists taking from popular culture, taking imagery and altering, changing, using artworks or using materials that are non-traditional like um, Rauschenberg's bed. So let's go ahead and define pop art. Um, this is actually by a British artist named Hamilton, um, who probably made the, the earliest pop art piece, but it's pretty much a style that was developed in the United States. So pop art is a reaction against abstract expressionism and a lot of the imitators of Jackson Pollock. It was a return to the pictorial image it was very much based on, at least at the beginning, on anti-emotion because abstract expressionism was all about deep, deep emotion, lots of angst, big artworks um, that were super, elite, like super charged with emotion. And so um, these artists of the pop art revolution used imagery that was based on everyday objects, things from popular cult culture, they would copy advertising, comic strips, product, celebrity, and they would alter them. And so this is kind of the next evolution based in synthetic cubism and data, where you're making non-art objects um, highbrow or moving them into the realm of art. Um, pop art also is reflection of the optimistic spirit of the 1960s. Remember that in the after World War II, we have the rise of um, U.S. culture and commerce. And so the 1960s, before a lot of protests, was a very optimistic time in our history of our country. And a lot of artists employed commercial art um, techniques. So and rather than just using traditional materials, they were often using materials um, that they would use for like... Um, advertising, printmaking that you would use for shirts or, or newspaper and so on. So pop art really is moving into um, postmodernism. Normally this is where I actually say modern art dies and we have the beginning of what we call postmodernism. Postmodernism is often based on these major ideas. Now, because we're not moving into postmodernism, um, because most of that is in content 10 that was taken off of the test, um, we do have a little bit of some of these popping through we've already seen. And the major one in pop art is this one that's called appropriation. Appropriation is where you take an image that belongs to someone else without permission and you reuse it and you change it, giving it new meaning. And so we're gonna see artists like Andy Warhol taking imagery and giving it new meaning. So in this image by Hamilton, what imagery do you see from popular culture? It's called what just what is it that makes today's home so different? This is actually 1955. It's a little bit earlier than 1960. If you think about what was happening in the 50s, we had the space race. So you might notice that the ceiling is the moon. You have a bodybuilder holding a lollipop. You have a vacuum. So this is probably coming from an ad. You have a comic book. Um, you have canned ham. You have a Jackson Pollock painting. Um, this is um, how people would often listen to music. They would use, listen to tape reels rather than just records. You have a TV, probably something maybe based on pornography or sex imagery. You have a TV. We have a Ford emblem. You can see that most of this is collaged with imagery from popular culture, you know, even taking from movies. Okay, so that leads us to Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe. Um, in a lot of the later imagery, there's not a lot of recordings on Khan Academy, but I was able to find some things to support your learning. 
So we're going to focus on pop art and why Andy Warhol was so important. This is the art assignment. It's not too long. We're going to be looking at how he was pop art, um, but then we'll also focus on how this artwork that's in our image set is similar to abstract expressionism. So you've heard of Andy Warhol and you So you've heard of Andy Warhol and you know he did the soup cans and the portraits. But today I want to tell you why his work really is interesting and worth your consideration. Here's the case for Andy Warhol. You know him to look like this, but Andrew Warhol was born in Pittsburgh to Slovakian immigrant parents and started out looking like this. He grew up sickly and spent a lot of time at home drawing with his mom, but he eventually escaped to New York after graduating from Carnegie Tech in 1949. He changed his name and quickly became a success as a commercial illustrator. He developed a signature technique that allowed him to trace and copy images and create a delicate, blotted line. It was an early instance of his affinity for automation, or finding other people or processes that do the work for and with him. He was determined to make it in the field of so-called fine art and started shopping for a way in. Instead of making art for advertisements, he started making advertisements as art choosing subject matter that would find traction with the emerging field of pop art. He made paintings of Coca-Cola, S&H green stamps, and of course, Campbell's soup cans. He saw these things as a common language, saying, What's great about this country is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same things as the poorest. And it wasn't about the individual things so much as the sheer abundance of things, which reflected the spread of mass manufacturing and growing post-war American consumer culture. Warhol started out using rubber stamps and stencils to make these paintings, but soon landed on silk screening as a way to speed things up. He created his well-known factory and set to work with assistants, rolling out product after product, displaying them in warehouse-like arrangements. He was also interested in products of the human variety and started making paintings of celebrities, reproducing images from publicity stills, newspapers, and magazines, making shrewd commentary on the celebrity as commodity. There are a number of subjects that recur in Warhol's work. Shoes, products, money, celebrities, rich people, disaster, death, himself. Shoes, products, money, celebrities, rich people, disaster, death, himself. But these weren't just Warhol's obsessions. They are deeply reflective of the culture of the time. If you ascribe to the theory that the 20th century was the American century, then Warhol's work takes on even more importance. His work charts the development of our obsession with fame and questions the growing commercialization and uniformity of most areas of American life. Warhol was an extremely astute business person who formed his first corporate entity, Andy Warhol Enterprises, in 1957, and he never really stopped working for hire. He made thousands of commissioned portraits, the first of which was this one of art collector Ethel Skoll, based on photos taken by a machine, or rather a photo booth. By the 1970s, commissioned portraits were a solid chunk of Warhol's income. Anyone could have their portrait made for $25,000, with additional canvases available at discounted rates. Along with his services, Warhol was also keen to trade on his own image, creating numerous self-portraits throughout his career and offering himself up for endorsements. And of course, Warhol was not just an artist, but also a filmmaker, band manager, magazine publisher, and TV producer who fearlessly explored and embraced new media. From the 1950s until his untimely death in 1987, Warhol was a shapeshifter, always open to the new, always innovating, and always reflecting the time. Like Jay-Z but far earlier, he understood that to be an artist in a market economy meant not being a businessman, but being a businessman, and he turned himself into a globally recognized brand. People debate whether Warhol defined an ad-driven factory-made culture or was defined by it, but his work remains important because what mattered to Warhol proved prophetic. People called him a sellout, but by laying bare the relationship between commerce and art, Warhol nullified the very idea of a sellout, and in the process made possible the work of Jeff Koons, Shepard Ferry, and so many contemporary artists. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at our Marilyn diptych. Let's look how at how it is from pop art, but also how it's similar to abstract expressionism. Okay, so hopefully you know who Marilyn Monroe is. She's a famous actress. Um, so she was an image from popular culture. And in the way that he depicted her, at least on the side, um, on the left here, side here, he used very artificial sort of bright colors. That's pretty characteristic of pop art. Also, the way that he made it, he made it using silk screen so that he could mass produce the imagery, right? Now, this one, <clears throat> excuse me, 
does have some elements of abstract expressionism as well. It is a monumental size, so it's a rather large painting. It pretty much has all of the imagery covering the entire surface. It really lacks a focal point and doesn't have a lot of visual depth. So he's learning and changing the style of abstract expressionists uh, and deriving it from popular culture, right? So thinking about his process and how he makes his imagery um, and what it does, what he did is he used seriograph. Seriograph is what we call screen printing, and that's the method in which most of us have like t-shirts, they're printed, the ink is printed onto the surface. It's done in a mass production. And so he would use this technique to make these paintings. He would often go back in and hand print them. So he had what he called a factory. So he had a group of artists who would work with him and they would print these images together. Sometimes he wouldn't with his touch artwork them at in all. demand as never before, Warhol resolved to step up production. In January 1963, he moved his studio from the parlor of his townhouse, no longer large enough to accommodate his larger paintings, to the third floor of an abandoned red brick firehouse a few blocks away on East 87th Street. All in New York. In June, to increase production still further, he took on a new assistant, a 20-year-old college student from the Bronx named Gerard Malanga, who had learned how to silkscreen a few years before while working for a necktie manufacturer. So he's pressing the ink through a screen. The more you look at Warhol's work, the more you look at Warhol, the more you see a mind constantly engaged in the studio. We see him making a series of decisions in the studio, how one painting leads to another painting, how one series leads to another painting. There are a series of insights and you get a sort of logic almost that unfolds in the studio that's of an intensely committed and engaged, sophisticated and thoughtful artist. So think about how fast he just printed that image of Marlon Brando, right? And he can make as many copies of that as he chooses, right? So what he was able to do is use seriograph to take this image of Marilyn Monroe and print it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, right? So think about how he creates meaning by printing her image over again. What is he trying to say about Marilyn Monroe and how does the image change, right? Does anyone know how she died, right? She died of a drug overdose when she was about 40 years old. And so she was probably one of the most popular actresses at this time. And she started to reach the age where she was probably going to have a less like film roles. And so she was pretty depressed. And so um, he shows her image kind of fading and distorting as he goes, even notice that this fades. This image was made shortly after her death, right? The image that he took was from a publicity shot from the, the movie, Some Like It Hot. And so it was one of her most famous paint, um, famous like well-known images, right? And he uses religious formats a lot for these early pieces of pop art. So in this one of the diptych, remember that many altar pieces were done in diptych formats. In this image that's in our textbook, it's almost as if she's a Byzantine icon. So why is he showing her in this manner, right? He wants to make a statement about how this actress is seen like a god. She's seen like a goddess, right? No one knows who she what she's really like, right? There's this kind of artificial quality to it when you look at the left. The color is gaudy, it's bright, it's cheerful, and it masks the, the, like the inner torment that she had on the inside, right? And here maybe is part of what she was really feeling like is that maybe she was going to be no longer in the newspaper. Notice it's kind of like in black and white, Maybe she won't be as popular anymore, and maybe she'll 
fade into oblivion. skip ahead here. 93, and how Frida Kahlo saw herself in 1938. Marilyn Monroe's identity, however, was shaped by the public. In 1953, this is how America saw her. One of many publicity photos for the film Niagara. She was about to become one of the most famous people alive. A decade later, she dies of a drug overdose. Within a few months, Andy Warhol takes that publicity photo and creates this painting. The tabloid culture as we know it took off in the 1950s. The American public was no longer satisfied by this. They wanted this. After Monroe's death, everyone's trying to tell her story, paint the definitive portrait. Who was she really? Who wants the truth? That's what show business is for. To prove that it's not what you are that counts, it's what they think you are. Warhol takes the publicity photo and creates this. A silk screen of a photo. A reproduction of a reproduction against gold. I don't know where the artificial stops and the real starts. It was Warhol's definitive portrait of Marilyn Monroe, the tabloids, and the public. How America saw Marilyn Monroe in 1962. How Glenn Ligon's friends saw my hand. All right, so it's more than just image about her. It's not that optimistic, bright, cheerful artwork that we normally associate with pop art. It has a lot more deep religious sort of meaning, right? So he's pulling from, you know, medieval, renaissance, Byzantine icon imagery, right? And he's giving her this sort of um, godlike status, right? He did a lot of imagery based on popular culture. And I think that these are some of those, um, this is based on the race riots of the South. I think some of these pieces kind of get forgotten by other images like this, right? Popular actors, his soup cans, Brillo pads, right? He often would change um, product design. Um, he was very much obsessed with Campbell's soup. He ate it every single day for lunch. His mom would make it for him, and his mom lived with him until her death. Um, this is Roy Lichtenstein, and he took imagery from comic books, and he used the newsprinting um, technique of Bendet dots to create his color. So he used little dots to create all that you see here. So we'd often take the most dramatic moments, right? I don't care. I'd rather sink than call Brad for help. And he would paint them in a monumental scale. Sometimes the dots are a little bit more obvious than on others. Toward the end of his career, his dots tended to get bigger and bigger. So the last piece that we have for pop art is Lipstick Ascending on Caterpillar Tracks by Klaus Oldenburg. There's no in, um, video for this one either. Um, there is an article on Khan Academy that you can look over, but I did find this video from a community college in Philadelphia that was pretty good. Except for the music. Welcome to Art History Abbreviated. I'm Sarah Ibsen of the Art Department at the Community College of Philadelphia. I am for an art that a kid licks after peeling away the wrapper. I am for an art that joggles like everyone's knees when the bus traverses an excavation. I am for an art that comes out of a chimney like black hair and scatters in the sky. I am for an art that flaps like a flag or helps blow noses like a handkerchief. These are just a few lines of the poetic artist statement of Klaus Oldenburg a member of the pop art movement of the 1960s. Oldenburg was most well known for his public art installations of large scale sculpture and for his reinterpretation of the art gallery known simply as the store. Focusing primarily on everyday objects, Oldenburg's works can be found around the world in museums, galleries, homes, public parks, and private businesses. Here in Philadelphia, just across the street from City Hall, stands a 40 foot tall clothespin, a perfect example of Oldenburg's tendency to glorify the unremarkable.
While many of his works are initially met with ridicule or indifference, some are eventually embraced for their whimsical take on commonplace objects and their unique insight into current cultural and political events. Both of these characteristics are typically associated with the pop art movement, which placed visual elements of popular culture in new contexts in order to challenge the viewer to contemplate the object in a new way. Highly controlled and often mechanical in its production, this movement was, in many ways, a direct response to the wild and gestural style of abstract expressionism, best embodied by the work of Jackson Pollock. The most memorable aspects of Oldenburg's works are their colossal size and their interactive nature. One such interactive sculpture was a creation that included a vinyl constructed tube of lipstick, which would deflate unless a participant repumped air into it. The work, entitled Lipstick Ascending on Caterpillar Tracks, was originally installed on the campus of Yale University in 1969. The gold colored tube of orange lipstick was mounted on a large base equipped with treads like those of a tank. This work, Oldenburg's first monumental public sculpture, is an ideal example of the artist's pop art style. What do we do with this object? How do we interpret it? Oldenburg tells us that the work is intended to symbolize the anti-war sentiments of the students of Yale's art school. The huge tube of lipstick was originally placed in front of the university's World War II tribute honoring fallen students. Through this placement, the object becomes a parody on the heroic and monumental by becoming monumental and unheroic. Furthermore, 1969 was a significant year for Yale University. Women had just been admitted to the university for the first time, the war in Vietnam continued to be waged, and student demonstrations were taking place on campuses across the nation. Oldenburg's sculpture, with its combination of masculine and feminine characteristics, became an ideal platform from which students could rally about gender equality in the war, and the installation was eventually covered with posters and graffiti. By 1970, the constant use of the sculpture had caused it to begin to deteriorate, and in 1974, lipstick ascending on caterpillar tracks was redesigned in a sturdier aluminum form and was permanently installed on Yale's Morse College. Still, when interpreting a 30-foot tall tube of lipstick as a strong statement of anti-war sentiment, we must acknowledge that we have fallen directly into Oldenburg's trap. We are pondering the meaning of the ordinary. As Oldenburg said of his own work, the main reason for the colossal objects is the obvious one, to expand and intensify the presence of the vessel, the object. Because my work is naturally non-meaningful, the meaning found in it will remain doubtful and inconsistent, which is the way it should be. All that I care about is that, like any startling piece of nature, it should be capable of stimulating meaning. Thank you for joining me on Art History Abbreviated. For more information about the art department, please con. Okay. So a lot of times with pop art, people see it as being very light and fluffy, but the two images that they decided to incorporate into the 250 are anything but light and fluffy. So thinking about the context of it, who were the patrons of Lipstick Ascending and where was it placed? She did mention a little bit of this in the video. It was requested as a monument to the second American Revolution as a protest piece by the students of Yale University. It was, um, they said the art students, but also it was the architecture students of it. It was placed in front of the president's office, which also was next to the World War I Memorial. And it was not intended to be a permanent installation. It was supposed to be temporary. Now, looking at this, why would he choose to use a lipstick and a tank? What could they possibly symbolize? I also think that besides just the imagery, why does, is it something that inflates and deflates? What was the meaning behind it, right? So that's the original that we have here on the left. It would inflate and deflate, right? All right. I had a slide there. Um, lipstick. Lipstick is very... Um, feminine, right? It also is something that's kind of fake. It's like an illusion, right? Then the tanks are very maybe masculine, right? It's put with war. And so we incorporate these two unlikely things together to show contradiction. It's neither feminine nor a masculine thing, right? And then even the fact that it deflates 
could talk about its lack of poignancy, the fact that it no longer really functions as lipstick, no longer functions as um, a tank. Maybe it's is something that's more sexual in nature. So this is all a protest piece. It's against the um, the lack of feminine, um, the lack of uh, female rights on the campus before um, this 1969 um, war sentiments of the time. Here's some examples of some of his gallery pieces. So like that inflatable, sometimes they're soft sculptures. So this one is a drum, right? And you can think if you were to hit it, it would thud. And this is a giant telephone suspended from the wall, right? Um, this is a hot water bottle that would be animated too. But a lot of his pieces like the clothespin in Philadelphia, the giant spoon in Minneapolis don't actually move. This one actually is a bridge. You can't walk across it though, right? Some of my favorite ones are the ones where he changes and changes them. So this is a Swiss Army knife with a boat or this open spiral notebook with pages flying across the college campus, right? So Oldenburg, right, often is trying to get you to think about what it is and allow you to have your own interpretation of it. This is Dwayne Hansen, another sculptor. He would do a lot of plaster casts of people and put them in installation settings. Let's end there today.